flat out, Deathloop is a blast. However, it is one of the most unconventional AAA games I've ever played, and as such, it can be a little disorienting at first. From the time looping mechanic, to the mission structure, to the upgrade system, and the interconnected levels, there's a lot to learn and discover. But since I had such a good time in this world, I couldn't resist sharing my best tips and tricks in hopes that they help you have just as much fun as I did. So if you're just diving in, here are 14 starting tips to help you get the most out of Deathloop. Once you get past the first couple of missions in Deathloop, you're free to go after any one of the five visionaries that possess one of the game's slabs. Those are the items that provide you with your special supernatural abilities. However, I recommend starting by going after the Shift Slab. This will take you to Charlie, who not only has the Shift Slab, which allows you to teleport, but he'll also drop a rare shotgun called the Strelac 5050 that comes with the extra perk of slowing down enemies that you shoot. This remained one of my go-to weapons throughout the entire game. Even on stealth runs, if I got caught, I could use the Strelac 5050 to blast my way through just about any encounter. However, one downside is that it does take forever to reload. To remedy this, equip the 5050 with the Speed Loader Trinket as soon as you find one. After that, you'll have one of the best close-ranged weapons in the entire game. This is for people who are literally just starting out and haven't played a single minute of Deathloop. It's as simple as this. Don't go in the water. If you do, you'll freeze, and in Deathloop, that means you'll die instantly. Even if you find a shallow pool of freezing water inland, waiting around will still cause damage. Thankfully, this doesn't really limit exploration, but it did catch me by surprise in my first or second run through the island of Black Reef. You can get through Deathloop pretty quickly if you just follow the main leads. Leads, by the way, are the game's core missions. But if that's all you do, you'll be missing out on a ton of extra content and gameplay. This world is packed with secrets to discover. You might find a door that requires a combination to open, or a trail of breadcrumbs that leads you to a powerful weapon. In one instance, I saw this letter O hanging from a crane. When I first saw it, it was just there. But when I revisited the same location at a different time of the day, I noticed it had some motion-detecting lasers pointing through the center. Naturally, I decided to jump through. I half expected to trigger a trap, but instead, jumping through the motion detector triggered a nearby container to open, revealing a powerful upgrade trinket. In another instance, I found a crank that I could pick up, but I had no idea where to use it. Well, a few hours later, I found a locked safe, but to open it, I had to attach, you guessed it, a crank. These are just two of dozens, and I mean dozens, of discoveries that wait for you on Black Reef, if you're curious enough to seek them out. This one may seem obvious, but I got burned by this early on. Once you obtain your first slab, you might think, great, one down, four to go. But it's not quite that simple. Just like with guns and trinkets, you have to infuse slabs with residium between districts in order to keep from losing them between entire runs. Basically, when you leave a district, you'll have the opportunity to infuse your slabs before entering the next district. This is important because if you obtain a slab, then run out of your reprise ability, those are your extra lives, and get killed all before infusing the slab, well, that run is over and you'll lose the slab. So here's my tip. When you get your first or second slab, you're likely gonna be pretty underpowered. And if you have only one or even worse, zero reprise abilities left, don't dilly-dally. That's what I did, but I ended up getting killed while I was just exploring, when I could have easily just made a beeline for the exit. And here's my second tip. When you do get to the Infuse menu, upgrade your slabs first. If you spend your residium on guns and trinkets, you might not have enough left to upgrade your slabs. And slabs are by far the most valuable items to keep from one run to the next. 
Again, this might seem basic and it'll all become second nature soon enough, but it's a total bummer if you lose a slab early on just because you didn't quite get how the upgrade system works. Deathloop only lets you carry three guns at a time. So what if you're carrying your three favorite weapons, then you find another that you want to just try out? Well, as long as you've infused a weapon, or any item for that matter, you'll always wake up the next day with that weapon in your inventory, even if you leave it behind. The same goes for slabs. You can only carry two slabs, so when you get a new one, you'll be forced to leave an old one behind. But don't panic. So long as a weapon or slab is infused with Residium, you've got nothing to worry about. One item that Colt automatically carries with him from each run to the next is the Strelak Sapper Charge. Basically, this is your hand grenade. But one thing that went over my head for quite some time is that the Sapper Charge is way more than just a hand grenade. It's also a trip mine and a proximity mine. You can select basic grenades by pressing left on the D-pad, but if you hold down the left D-pad button, you'll be given the option to change it from a standard grenade to, like I said, a proximity mine or a trip mine. Now, I know some of you are saying the game covers this in a tutorial early on, and that's true, but with how much death loop throws at your way at the start of the game, this one, at least for me, was easy to miss. One stealth tactic that Arcane Studios brought over to Deathloop from Dishonored is the aerial execution. But unlike in Dishonored, and maybe I just missed it, I don't remember seeing a tutorial in Deathloop on how to pull it off. Basically, if you jump down on any enemy from no matter how high, you can press R1 right before you hit them to perform an aerial execution. Not only is this move totally silent and great for stealth, but you can also use it to completely break your fall from any height. Weapons in Deathloop have rarities. Gray, blue, purple, and gold, in that order. Gray, blue, and purple guns are found throughout the world as loot. But the game hints early on at the existence of gold guns. And after the first couple hours of gameplay, you might wonder, where are they? That's because they're not dropped by enemies as simple loot. Instead, you have to complete certain missions in order to find them and add them to your inventory and these missions don't appear in your leads menu until you've triggered them out in the world. Basically, there are four gold guns in the game, at least that I've found, one in each district, and the missions that lead you to them can only be triggered at certain times of the day. I won't spoil specifically where to find them, a simple Google search will help with that. But for example, if you want to find, say, the sniper rifle, you'll need to be in a particular district during a particular time of day, and that will trigger the lead that you'll have to complete within that district to get the rifle. The same process, more or less, applies to the other gold weapons as well, and while these aren't necessarily the best weapons in the game, they are, in my opinion, the most interesting. For example, one is a set of pistols that you can actually dual wield, but if you want, you can combine them to create a machine gun. Pretty cool. While enemy trip mines are easy to see in Deathloop thanks to their red lasers, landmines are much harder to see because they blend in with the environment, especially if they're set in tall grass. They do have a blinking light and they also beep, so if you're looking and listening, they will set you off to their presence. But if you're just starting out or you're not on the lookout, you're bound to get blown up a time or two. Now, I've watched a couple of videos where people were totally unaware that you can actually disarm mines. Similar to trip mines, just sneak up slowly until the button prompt appears to disarm. But be warned, land mines are way more sensitive than trip mines, so they might explode even if you're being careful. I found it much easier to shoot them, but yeah, that's not the best approach if you're trying to be sneaky.
One thing Deathloop does extremely well is that it keeps a record of everything you need to remember in order to make progress from loop to loop. If you find a clue, it'll be recorded in your Discoveries tab, which you can organize by time of day and by district. If you find the combination to, say, a particular safe, that combination will not only be recorded here, but it will also appear on that specific safe's display when you actually find it. And if you run across some information that pertains to a core mission objective, it will be recorded in your leads menu. Perhaps best of all, every single note, email, and audio recording that you'll find, some of which are pretty long, are summed up in an extremely concise Cliff Notes version that will appear when you discover it and which can be referenced later again in the game's pause menu. This means you not only don't have to write anything down, you don't even have to read anything in full if you really don't want to. Even when the complexity of the broader murder puzzle felt a bit overwhelming, I was always able to find the information I needed to solve whatever challenge I was working on. This tip might not be for everyone, but for me, I didn't really get a tight grasp on how Deathloop's time progression worked until I picked one district and spent each of the game's four time periods in that district one after another. I picked Updam, or Updam, however you pronounce it, but you could pick any of the four districts. I then followed the objectives that were available to me in that district, and I searched for as many clues as I could find. When I was done with that time period, I moved on to the next, but I stayed in Uptum. This allowed me to see just how much one district can change from morning to noon to afternoon to evening. Plus, it allowed me to see how fun and advantageous it can be to learn each level inside and out. Like in the Dishonored games, these areas are packed with shortcuts and secrets that can give you a tactical advantage in combat and reward you with weapons and trinkets. Again, this playstyle might not be for everyone, but if you're struggling to wrap your mind around just how Deathloop works, and I wouldn't blame you if you did, this might be a good way to approach your next run. Deathloop has two types of main quests. There are visionary leads, which guide you toward the objectives that will get you closer to breaking the loop, then there are arsenal leads, which guide you to the different slabs, each of which provides you with a new supernatural ability. It may be tempting to just power through the visionary leads if you're the type to tackle main quests first, but trust me when I say you'll have a much easier and more fun time exploring Black Reef and engaging in combat once you have the slabs that suit your playstyle. And speaking of... Okay, this one is totally subjective. This tip should actually be titled, start with whatever slabs you prefer. But if you want to focus on exploring Black Reef with the utmost freedom, and you want to take a stealthy approach, I'd recommend first going after the Shift Slab, which lets you teleport around levels. It also lets you teleport behind enemies so you can pull off sneaky assassinations. Next, get Aether, which lets you go invisible. This also helps with stealth assassinations, not to mention exploration if you're in a crowded area. And then there's Nexus, which lets you link up enemies so that you can take them all out at once. Now, as I've mentioned, you can only take two slabs out with you at any given time, and I eventually preferred the combination of Aether and Nexus. This allowed me to link up as many enemies as possible, then go invisible so I could still sneak up for a behind-the-back assassination, killing multiple enemies at once. But then, what about Shift? Well, this is a fantastic ability for just starting out, and it did help me discover a ton of shortcuts. But once you learn the levels, the game's double jump ability, while not as powerful as Shift, doesn't require a slab, and it actually lets you reach a lot of high up places. So with Aether and Nexus equipped as my slabs, I was still able to use the double jump as a bit of a poor man's Shift. This gave me the perfect blend of stealthy combat and flexible exploration. Now, if you're more of a combat-focused player, you might still prefer Carnesis, which lets you toss enemies around like ragdolls, or Havoc, which reduces the damage you take while increasing the damage you dish out. To each their own.
As you probably know, you can highlight core mission objectives on your HUD by selecting them in the Leads and Visionaries section of the Mission Details tab in the Pause menu. These will be either orange or, if they mark the location of a visionary, red. But right below, in the Discoveries section of the same tab, you can also highlight simple discoveries that have nothing to do with your core missions. Say you find a door that requires a combination to unlock. Chances are it'll be marked in your Discoveries tab, and if it's got a white diamond next to it, you can select this, which will then bring up a white diamond in your HUD, guiding you to that particular door. This goes for many of the locations and puzzles you'll find on Black Reef, and it just goes to show how, like I said in a previous tip, you shouldn't ever have to write anything down in this game, even if it's the location of some obscure secret that you'll know you'll want to revisit some hours later. And there you have it. I hope these tips help you get off to a good start in Deathloop, one of my clear contenders for Game of the Year. I plan on shifting the content on my channel to include a lot more tips and strategy guides, so if you like this video, consider subscribing for more videos just like this. And if you liked the video, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, and if you didn't, leave a thumbs down. As always, I want to thank my boss mode patrons Brock and Bare Knuckle Bob. If you'd like to support this channel on Patreon, you'll literally be helping me create future content just like this. You'll find the link in the description. Lastly, you can follow me on Twitter at Quest Mode Games, and with that, I want to remind everyone to never stop questing.